Okay, good evening, everyone. I uh, hope you can hear me okay. Uh, so I'm Jim Mallinson. I'm the chair of the Patoa Centre for Yoga Studies. Uh, we've um, been putting on a series of lectures, as you may well know, but in case you don't, the previous ones are all available on our YouTube channel to watch. Uh, and if you want to keep up with what's coming, future events, we've got an exciting programme ahead. Uh, look at our Facebook page or Instagram as well, I think still being updated. Uh, and uh, yes, we hope to see you at more events. We've recently increased our capacity. So I think we're maximum 300 now we can have at events. So that's great. We've got plenty this evening. Um, so it gives me great pleasure to uh, introduce this evening's speaker, Professor Shaman Hutley. I'm very privileged to call a friend and a colleague. I've worked with him on various uh, texts, in particular uh, read, um, had several reading groups with him where we've been reading texts we've been editing and that's uh, been a highlight of my academic career. Shaman is Associate Professor of Asian Studies and Religious Studies at the University of Massachusetts in Boston. <clears throat> and his doctoral thesis is relevant to the topic uh, he's going to be talking to us about today. It's on the uh, a Shaiva Tantra called the Brahma Yamala and Shaiva Yogini cults. He completed that in 2007 under the direction of Professor Harunaga Isaacson uh, at the University of Pennsylvania. After that, he taught in Montreal at Concordia University. Uh, and his research continues to focus on early tantric Shaivism, goddess cults, and yoga. Recent publications include the, uh, I've got it here, the Brahma Yamala Tantra. I hope you can see that. Yeah, that looks like it should be showing up. The Brahma Yamala Tantra or Pichumata Volume 1. Uh, it's a critical edition of various chapters and then annotated translation. So he looks at the contents of the text and also, uh, I think, as will be, um, he'll be continuing in that vein this evening because he um, looks at material culture as well and how we can read the text uh, in tandem with material culture. Uh, and his current projects include a, a monograph on the figure of the yogini in early medieval India, continuing uh, uh, editing of more chapters of the Brahma Yamala, but also the Devi Purana and uh, a text called the Kaula Gyana Nirnaya attributed to Matsyendra Nath. And I've been privileged to see bits of that already and it promises to be another uh, fantastic work. He also um, was an editor of a volume that's just out uh, called Shaivism and the Tantric Traditions, which is essays in honor of our shared teacher, Professor Alexis Sanderson. Another fine volume, very finely edited. Um, so it just remains for me to hand over to Shaman, who's going to be talking to us about Yogini temples and their antecedents, reassessing the textual evidence. Good evening, Shaman. Good evening, and afternoon, night, whatever it is for you in different parts of the world. Thank you so much, Jim, for that kind introduction. It's really been one of the highlights of the last few years for me to participate in the Hatha Yoga text reading workshops. And although I had envisioned being in London for another one and, and giving this lecture at, at that time, uh, it's nice to be able to connect in a different way, probably with more people uh, in um, various parts of the world. So thank you very much for that kind introduction. And I will start my slides now. I hope you can hear me okay. So this presentation concerns the interpretation of medieval Indian temples dedicated to yoginis, a distinctive class of tantric goddess. With roots in ancient Indic cults of matris or mother goddesses, yoginis came to feature in the medieval Shaiva and Buddhist tantric traditions by around the beginning of the 8th century. In the texts of tantric Shaivism, yoginis are characterized by such qualities as Therianthropism, that is having animal faces, by shape-shifting, uh, particularly taking on the forms of female animals, and I'm uh, happy to introduce you to a likely yogini on the cot behind me, a female cat. Sorry, that probably didn't work very well. Uh, the power of flight, organization into matriarchal deity clans, or kulas, and guardianship over esoteric knowledge. One of the most striking aspects of the yogini is the tendency to blur boundaries between the human and divine. Through perfection in tantric ritual, it was held that women could join the ranks of these sky-traversing goddesses, the Kachudis. 
Emerging from marginal esoteric tantric traditions, yoginis became prominent fixtures of the religious landscape across religious and geographic boundaries. Nowhere is this more visible than in the numerous stone temples built for their worship from the 10th to 12th centuries. Etymologically speaking, a yogini is one who possesses or practices yoga and the feminine gender. The name thus signifies command of yoga, a meaning accentuated by the feminine near synonym yogeshi or yogeshwari, master of yoga, again in the feminine. Although one may associate yoga with meditation, asceticism, and corporeal manipulation, modern scholarship has come to recognize that extraordinary powers were equally constitutive of the category yoga. Some of the earliest references to yoginis in tantric literature emphasize this, referring to the goddesses as uh, yoga siddha, uh, perfected in yoga, possessing the mighty power of yoga, or possessing yogic majesty. Yogaishwarya. This is one traditional explanation for the name. Yoginis possess and may bestow Yogaishwarya, the eight lordly or numinous powers of yoga. Tantric literature, in fact, provides vast lists of the occult powers yoginis command, from the six acts or shat karma of tantric sorcery, such as driving away or killing enemies, to the preparation of magical elixirs entry into subterranean paradises, or joining the ranks of the Vidyadharas, uh, the celestial wizards. In an earlier essay, I had argued that yogini temples mark the entry of these goddesses into a wider religious domain, bridging the ritual worlds of Tantra and Purana, the esoteric revelation of initiatory cults on the one hand, and a scriptural genre of popular devotional theism on the other. In this presentation, I will examine new textual evidence which I wasn't aware of earlier or hadn't scrutinized in full detail. These sources, in my view, illuminate what may be important antecedents to yogini temples while offering further insight into the civic and in many respects ritually mainstream nature of these sites of worship. To put it differently, in, in, in some ways I feel like what I'm doing now is um, uh, reimagining re the yogini temples in a way that's less exotic, less less um, concerned with the image of a yogini as a dangerous, as a sexual, as a sanguinary being. Since many of you are likely not familiar with yogini temples, let me briefly review some of the sites and statuary under consideration. By the 10th century, yoginis became the focus of a temple cult of wide geographic distribution, which in some cases received patronage through at least the 14th century. Erected in stone from Odisha on to the Madhya Pradesh Rajasthan border and as far south as Tamil Nadu, these predominantly circular open air temples are architecturally unique in medieval India. Our knowledge of yogini temples owes much to Professor Vidya Deheji of Columbia University, whose 1986 monograph documented evidence for yogini temples and statuary, in many cases for the very first time. Her work remains an indispensable point of reference. Important recent work also includes Padma Kaimal's delightful 2012 monograph on the Yogini statuary from South India and an excellent 2019 dissertation chapter by Kimberly, Kimberly Masteller on the Eastern Kala Churi patronage of Central Indian Yogini temples. So I draw on all of this work and bring to this the sensibilities of a textual historian. Architectural remains have been identified for at least eight temples, while clusters of yogini statuary establish the existence, existence of eight or more others. References in texts and inscriptions allow us to infer several more possible sites with varying degrees of probability. Five of the surviving temple, temples are circular, while three central Indian temples, largely in ruins, are rectangular. All are open to the sky and have inward facing cells for yogini images to the extent that this can be de determined and several feature a central shrine in the courtyard with a cult image of Shiva, usually as Natesha or the Lord of Dance. At least five of the temples housed sets of 64 yoginis. Exceptional are the Bhairagat temple shown here, which enshrined as many as 81 deities, not all yoginis, but probably uh, all but a few of them were yoginis. And two ruined temples of central India, 
which might have housed 42. While the known temples cluster mainly in modern Madhya Pradesh and its border areas, as well as Orissa, the temples were not confined to these regions. One set of yoginis comes from the vicinity of Kanchipuram and Tamil Nadu. Inscriptional and archaeological evidence points towards construction of temples in Greater Bengal, and there is compelling textual evidence for a medieval yogini temple in Varanasi. Medieval Jain chronicles seem also to allude to yogini temples in Broch, Ajmer, Ujjain, and Delhi. The case for a yogini temple seems particularly strong for 11th to 12th century Delhi, known in period Jain sources as Yoginipura, city of yoginis. Yogini temples do not enshrine a group of deities with fixed individual identities. The goddesses vary considerably from one site to the next, although the well-known seven or eight mothers appear frequently, as do the Dingmatris, the female counterparts to the guardians of the directions, the Dikpalas. Similar variety obtains in textual sources to a lesser degree. The poor state of preservation often makes it difficult to identify individual yoginis, to assess the degree of overlap between sets of statuary and to understand how these might correlate to texts. The textual record has been characterized as offering relatively little insight into the construction of yogini temples, the identities of their pantheons, and worship within temple precincts. This understandable view was formed due to a number of factors. The absence of a description of circular temples, yogini temples and texts on architecture and iconography, that is the so-called Shilpa Shastras, due to our difficulty in identifying tantric ritual manuals that explicitly describe a liturgy for yogini temples. And finally, due, the, due to the difficulty of establishing precise correlations between yogini pantheons and texts and temples. It is true indeed that no known treatise on architecture describes a yogini temple per se. This absence also seems to extend to the Shaiva Pratishta Tantras, tantric scriptural texts dedicated to iconometry, iconography, and rites of image consecration, Pratishta. The first millennium tantric textual sources most deeply concerned with yoginis, that is the Vidyapita Bhairava Tantras and the Kaula Tantras which followed them, simply do not seem to envision the veneration of yogini groups and temples. Pantheons of 64 yoginis also show up rather late in the textual record. However, it is not entirely true that yogini temples lack attestation in tantric literature. Two major Shaiva sources on Pratishta, that is, rites of image consecration, from the late 9th to 10th centuries, from different regions of India, provide unambiguous evidence for the worship of 64 yoginis and images in temples. These are the Brihat Kalotra, uh, unpublished, which is a scriptural source, and the Lakshana Sara of Vairochana, a digest, uh, better known as the Pratishta Lakshana Sara Samuchaya. An account of 64 yoginis from a third Shaiva Pratishta Tantra, the Maya Deepika, survives in quotations in the Chaturvarga Chintamani of Hemadri. Though inclusive and eclectic, these sources belong to the comparatively mainstream Shaiva Siddhanta rather than antinomian goddess cults. The search for Kaula sources for yogini temples turns out to be somewhat misplaced. Puranas and Pratishta Tantras have much more to offer. In the rest of this presentation, I will focus on two such sources, one which has not been studied or edited previously, and that's the Brihat Kalutra. The second is chapter 50 of the Devi Purana, which I'm in, which I'm in the process of re-editing from its manuscripts. But before exploring these, I want to first discuss two Kala Tantric sources that may shed light on the kinds of Tantric ritual which inspired the creation of permanent structures for yogini worship. Tantras of the Kala cult of the hunchback goddess Kubjika contain what may be the earliest descriptions of the iconic forms of 64 yoginis. Texts of this tradition, the Pashtimamaya or Western transmission, are preserved extensively in, in Nepal, though some of them may have been composed in the Deccan. 
These represent a fertile field for study of yoginis in the period just before and during their worship in temples. The root text, the Kupji Kamata, perhaps from the 9th or 10th century, does not incorporate a pantheon of 64 yoginis, but later tantras of this system do so. The two tantras that I'd like to focus on here are the Srimatotra, that is the Uttara Tantra or Appendix Tantra of the Kubji Kamata, and the Shat Sahasra Sanghita, the compendium of 6,000 verses. These contain detailed accounts of the iconography and worship of a similar group of 64 yoginis as deities of tantric mandalas. In chapter 20 of the Srimadotra, and I'm speaking here of the Godaksha Samhita recension, and I'm very grateful to the Hatha Yoga Project for, for uh, transcribing this and providing me with the electronic text. Uh, so in the Srimadotra, 64 yoginis form the largest of several deity circuits in a mandala of Chandabhairava called the Kechari Chakra. There is no overt reference to the use of three-dimensional images here. The deities give the desired siddhi or occult power when worshipped in the mandala or visualized. Chapter 27 expands this pantheon of 64 to 81 in a mandala called the Wheel Transmission, the Chakram Maya. This grand mandala has at its heart the root wheel or mula chakra of 81 yoginis. Its nine groups of nine are arrived at by adding one new octad of yoginis to the 64 and by having the nine octads be presided over by nine matris. These are the standard seven mothers plus Chandika and Mahalakshmi. The nine mothers are paired with Pairavas at the naves of nine wheels, arrayed in the eight directions with Mahalakshmi's group at the center. Dehegia had studied this mandala, which she usefully diagrams and which I'm showing here. She saw this as a potential model for the Bhedagat Yogini temple's unusual pantheon of 81 goddesses. She also came to the conclusion that the Srimadotara's pantheon of 81 yoginis was intended primarily for royalty, supporting the view of the Bhairagat temple of 81 yoginis as a royal monument. There's certainly merit to Dehegia's interpretation, which has been widely repeated. The fruits of worship of the Chakram Naya are overwhelmingly concerns of state, such as gaining kingship, successful conquest, and the protection of the state from enemies. It is equally crucial to recognize the civic nature of this worship. Far from being the elective ritual of a solitary tantric sadhaka, the Chakram Naya worship is conducted by a Shaiva officiant, the Deshika, presumably for a wealthy client with a particular objective in mind. Commencing on one of 11 auspicious dates, the ceremony lasts up to seven nights, uh, up to nine nights, and is accompanied by grand festivities and a rich feast. This kind of grand ritual for state protection may well have inspired the translation of yogini mandalas into spaces for permanent worship. Chapter 15 of the Shet Sahasra Samhita, provisionally edited by Alexis Sanderson, provides a detailed account of the iconography of 64 yoginis similar to those of the Srimadotra. This too provides fruitful material for envisioning how the worship of yoginis and mandalas might have inspired enshrining these goddesses in temples. Both pantheons begin with the goddess Akshobhya, but about uh, 20 of the goddesses have different names and there are many variations in iconography. In the case of Shat Sahasra Samhita 15, the goddesses are grouped into uh, octads linked to the eight mothers, the Ashtamathris, and are presided over by Shikha Swachandapairava and the company of eight male guardians. Mantric forms of the yoginis are first delineated, followed by a detailed visual description and a brief account of their worship in a mandala. One is to make offerings of alcohol and meat to the goddesses in a lonely place on a dark night, away from the gaze of the uninitiated. There is no mention of three-dimensional images and the mandala is presumably drawn on the ground. The ritual's aims are diverse, though slanted towards nobility. A fallen king may regain his kingdom, a man without sons will have progeny, a warrior may be victorious and a merchant wealthy, while a dedicated sadhaka, a tantric practitioner, will become free of misfortune. 
Alternatively, the yogis may be worshipped on a regular basis, a recurring basis, in a mandala drawn on cloth or on the garment of a great warrior, perhaps worn as a talisman. Significantly, this chapter provides a supplemental teaching instructing that after defeating his enemy, a king should erect in the battlefield a shrine of Shikhaswachanda and the 64 yoginis measuring six hands in dimensions. Um, with elite patronage, these kinds of esoteric shrines based on mandalas might have served as models for grander permanent structures housing iconic images. There are strong links between these texts of the Kubjika cult and sources that describe worship of 64 yoginis and images. In fact, the Shetsahasra Samhita's account of yogini iconography might be the source of what is arguably the most influential yogini pantheon. This series of 64 goddesses, beginning with Akshobhya, appears with minor variations in several non-esoteric texts, as uh, Gudrun Buniman uh, first noted, these being the Agni Purana, the Lakshanasara, and the Mayadipika, as quoted by Himadri. These are Pratishta Tantras, uh, including the Agni Purana in some ways. The detailed iconographic descriptions of the yoginis are virtually identical in, in the Shat Sahasra Samhita and in the Lakshanasara. Surviving in a manuscript of around the 12th century, the Shat Sahasra Samhita was composed after the Kubjika Mata, but predates other major works of the Kubjika cycle and probably belongs to the period of the yogini temples, although it might incorporate earlier material. What seems so important about the yogini material in these sources, the Lakshanasara, Agni Purana, and Maya Deepika, is that this unambiguously concerns image worship rather than mandalas, and hence temples. These texts also point toward the growing prominence of yoginis in the religious landscape beyond the narrower confines of early esoteric traditions. Moreover, these sources provide us with the first case of strong correlation between text and yogini statuary. For Gudrun Meltzer has identified several yogini images from North Bengal with pedestal labels, whose identities appear to match the 64 goddesses that these texts delineate. This exciting discovery, presented at a conference many years ago, is still to be published, uh, but in my view provides convincing evidence that an apparently well-known set of 64 yoginis delineated in both tantric and Puranic texts was also translated into sculpture. I turn now to a newly discovered account, or at least uh, by newly discovered for me, uh, account of the worship of 64 yoginis in an unpublished Shaiva Tantra called the Brihad Kalutra. This is a long, eclectic, comparatively late redaction of the Kalutra, which survives in numerous recensions. Alexis Sanderson proposes that the Brihad Kalutra was redacted around 900 CE in Kashmir, thus belonging to the period of the yogini temples though no such structures should survive from Kashmir or, or the areas nearby. Due to its extensive material on religious images and temples, this text is sometimes included among the Pratishta Tantras. Two sections of the Brihat Kalotara concern a sequence of 64 goddesses in Bhairava. First, the account of a ritual called the Matri Vrata, or Mother Goddess Observance, and second, an unnumbered chapter on the worship of Matris in Bhairava. These pertain to the same set of deities, though there are discrepancies between the two chapters, and some text appears to be missing from each. While the term yogini is not used here, Matri and yogini are so frequently synonymous in period sources, um, and the goddesses' representations really fit squarely within the yogini typology. One should perform the Matri Vrata, the mother goddess observance, on the ninth day of the waxing fortnight in the summer month of Chaitra or in the autumnal month of Ashwana. This simply entails worship, worshiping the 64 mothers in Bhairava with offerings of white garlands, scented pastes, clothes, and food items, as well as making gifts to devotees of Shiva and the presiding Acharya. Devoid of esoteric elements, the observance may be undertaken by anyone, regardless of caste, gender, or initiation status. Through the observance, a young girl may obtain a groom and a woman numerous sons, even if she is barren. A king may obtain victory and unobstructed kingship, and others attain all-round success and freedom from danger. 
diseases, inauspicious dreams, and dangerous spirits cause no harm to one who performs the observance and afterwards contemplates the mothers with devotion. This Matri Vrata merely lists the 64 goddesses and is lean on ritual de detail. Fortunately, another section of the text, the Matri Bhairava chapter, describes their iconography in detail and occasionally adds useful information about ritual. This chapter belongs to a section of the text concerned with the construction of religious images and the ritual establishment. There can be little doubt that it envisions sculpted images of the 64 Matris, which are to be fashioned as a group of four, eight, 16, 32, or, or 64. The Brihat Kalotara's goddess pantheon includes the Ashtamatris, the eight mothers, led by Yogeshi, an emaciated, ferocious, eight-armed goddess astride a corpse. They are followed by the benign conqueror of poverty, Daridriya Damani, a smiling goddess, goddess radiant like the sun, bearing a lotus, sword, and a spear or trident, with which she impales poverty in the form of a man. Unusually, Chamunda is represented here as corpulent. The Matris also include, for instance, Gauri and Chandrika, goddesses of the four or five elements, Agni and so forth, Vinayaki, the four sisters, Jaya and so forth, and three goddesses associated with the Garuda Tantra medical tradition, Garudi, the snake-faced Twadita, and the avian Burunda. There are also multiple forms of Kali and Revati, and a host of goddesses with animal faces, after which they are named. Swan, horse, lion, tiger, jackal, owl, cat, bear, monkey, camel, dog, cow, and the Chakravaka bird. Completing the list are some unusual goddesses who receive additional attention. Putra Janani, bearer of sons, who holds a charming baby boy and gives sons to those who establish her image. And Sri Ghona, glorious snout, who is called chief of the mothers. Arani, a goddess of the forest, has 10 arms and five faces, one of those being that of a Garuda or eagle, the other faces being pleasing and white. She is surrounded by cattle and causes cattle to flourish. Finally, are Maya, a beautiful, youthful, 10 armed goddess who dances and plays music, and Nidra, sleep, who reclines upon a bed. Bhairava himself is not described. Both lists of goddesses are incomplete in the manuscripts I've consulted, but the 64 deities' identities can be ascertained more or less by putting the two accounts together. This set of 64 goddesses does not precisely match any other I am aware of, though almost all the deities are attested in other yogini groups. The Krama Jayadratha Yamala, a tantric text, possibly of Kashmir, and the Kriya Kala Gunotra, a medical tantra, in particular, have notable parallels. At least 20 goddesses are posed in dance, calling to mind sculpted sense of, sets of dancing matris and yoginis, such as the all-dancing yoginis of the Ranipur Jharial temple, where Shiva presides as Natasha, lord of dance. The goddesses have distinctive colors, emblems, and vehicles, mainly animals and corpses, but also lotuses, a tree, and fine beds. Several features of the Brihat Kalotra's accounts of the 64 Matri stand out to me. First is their very presence in this text. While eclectic, this tantra belongs neither to the Kala nor antinomian Bhairava tantras, but rather to a venerable cycle of Siddhanta tantras. The inclusion of yoginis in the Brihat Kalotra is important testimony to their integration into mainstream religion, with a place similar to and contiguous with that of the cult of the seven mothers. Like accounts of 64 yoginis in the Lakshana Sara and other sources concerned with Pratishta, the Brihat Kalotara unambiguously envisions worship of goddesses and images, hence in temples, even if it makes no reference to the circular open air architecture of the extant yogini temples. Also notable is that while the Matri Vrata specifies that the goddess is number 64, the Matri Bhairava chapter speaks of enshrining groups varying in number, uh, that is smaller groups, uh, up to and including 64. In addition, the account of the Matri, God, uh, the Matri Vrata, the mother goddess observance, helps at least uh, 
elucidate one ritual context for the veneration of yoginis or mathris in temples. A religious observance, a vrata, performed on a specific auspicious day with a range of possible motivations from fertility to success or safety. The Matri Vratta belongs to a chapter called Observances for Possessing Spirits, the Graha Vratta Patala, which mainly concerns calendrical observances connected to the mainstream deities such as Kumara, Kamadeva, Gauri, Surya, and Chandra, in part to avert harmful influences. As with other vratas treated in this chapter, worship of the Matris is devoid of esoteric content and does not require tantric initiation. Although the Matri Vrata offers only a narrow window into the individual's motivations and rituals connected with temple worship of yoginis, the view it provides is invaluable. Interpretations of yoginis based mainly on iconography have tended to focus on the sanguinary, sexual, and esoteric. Padma Kaimal's insightful in interpretation of the Tamil statuary is a notable exception. The Brihat Kalotra depicts yogini veneration as socially inclusive and ritually mainstream, along the lines of the earlier temple cult of the Saptamathris, the Seven Mothers. Notably, the safety of the state, martial success, and other elite aims receive no special attention. The Devi Purana, which we can probably place in Eastern India in approximately the eighth or ninth century, attests deep familiarity with Tantric Shaivism. Far more than a collection of narratives on the goddess's demon slain exploits, of which there are plenty, this is a rich and eclectic document critical to understanding the early medieval religious landscape and the emergence of what we might call public Shaktism in particular. It is the single most important textual source concerning the temple cult of the seven mothers. It seems to predate the, yog the temples of yoginis. Excuse me. It seems to predate the temples of yoginis. It mentions these goddesses infrequently and never as a group of 64. Nonetheless, it presents what may be a unique antecedent to the yogini temples. Chapter 50 of the Devi Purana teaches an elaborate system for worship of the goddess in 60 forms, goddesses who correspond to the 60 years, the samvatsara, uh, of the calendrical cycle, and are to be worshipped perpetually for the kingdom's prosperity and protection. Notwithstanding key differences, there are multiple ways in which this ritual program connects with the subsequent yogini temples. Study of the Devi Purana has, has suffered from the poor condition of the received text, which has discouraged historical scholarship or led to incomplete results. While printed twice in the late 19th and early, uh, late, or late 19th century and in the early 1970s, these editions are of poor quality and make only limited use of regionally restricted manuscript evidence. Uh, my work on this text is grounded in study of manuscripts uh, so far mainly from those in archives in Nepal, Bengal, London and Pune. At 342 verses, chapter 50 is by far the lengthiest of the entire Devi Purana, and my critical edition of this is a work in progress, very much so. So to summarize briefly, chapter 50 names the supreme goddess as Sarva Mangala, the all-beneficent. All she is also the first of the 60 Devis who preside over each of 60 years of a cycle of time based on Jupiter's transit. This cycle and the other astronomical categories involved derive from a chapter on Jupiter's movements from the influential 6th century Brihat Sanghita of Varaha Mihira. The Devi Purana chapter describes rituals for rendering time and all of its various divisions auspicious. Worship of the 60 forms of the goddess addresses the specific dangers and opportunities presented by each year of the cycle. In addition to the 60 goddesses, the chapter teaches an elaborate mandala of the 12 Brahmanical gods in multiple forms of Surya who preside over 12 yugas, each representing a five-year sub-cycle. While worship of the goddesses is perpetual, worship of the mandala of yuga deities is an occasional ceremony modeled on tantric initiation, probably intended for the wealthy patron, the Yajamana, who sponsors worship of the 60 deities. The 60 are presented in three sets of 20, grouped according to the three gunas of Prakriti, 
thus sattvic, rajasic, and tamasic goddesses. The three groups are presided over by Sarvamangala herself, the mother goddess Brahmi, and Kali. For each goddess, the text supplies an iconographic description as well as a distinctive ritual procedure, specifying the appropriate offerings for worship and for fire sacrifice, Homa. Much attention is given to Pratishta, the rites of installation for consecrating the goddess's images initially. The chapter concludes by proclaiming thus, in a land where the goddesses always receive this worship, the clouds rain year round, the earth is full of grain, Brahmins are devoted to the sacrifice and Ishti rites, the cows of the land are full of milk, women are always chaste, servants are devoted to their masters, and there is never a calamity nor accidental death, O sage. Propitiated, the goddesses are beneficent, and the years are full of all bounty and success. Multiple options are envisioned for the deity images. These may be constructed of various materials, from stone to precious metals. If installed in a small shrine, the images should measure from seven to 12 digits, that is approximately 12 and a half to 21 and a half centimeters. If installed in a temple, the images should measure between one cubit and a truly monumental 15 cubits, upwards of uh, 22 and a half feet or seven meters. The spatial arrangement of the goddesses is not clear, though the group was once called a Matri Chakra, a circle of mother goddesses. This, of course, raises the possibility of a circular arrangement as found in many yogini temples. The structure for permanent worship receives no description, unfortunately. Much more detail is lavished upon the pavilion, the altar, the archway, and the mandala used for Pratishta, the initial consecration ritual. After installation, the devis are to receive daily worship, either individually as a group of 60 or in groups of five, divided by the yugas. It may be the case that the goddess of a particular year becomes the focal point for the year's duration. Daily worship follows normative paradigms of puja and homa, with the addition of tantric mantras. The rites and aims are inflected according to the distinctive nature of each goddess. Aparajita, for example, is worship with offerings of sandalwood, kumkum powder, various milk products and foods, and also by making offerings to brahmanas to, and feeding and worshiping maidens. The goddess Kaushiki, a dark, fierce skull bearer, receives the non-vegetarian offerings of bali and meat and rice, garlands of black flowers, and fire offerings of frankincense and aloe wood. Worship of the 60-fold Sarva Mangala is sponsored by a wealthy patron and directed by a tantric officiant, the Acharya. The overwhelming concern with protection of the state, martial success, the quelling of natural calamities, and making the land bountiful, alongside the considerable labor and wealth required to perform the rites, point towards royalty as the intended patrons. The 60 deities are not designated as yoginis, but as devis, goddesses. While they share much in common with yoginis, there is also a critical difference. Animal-faced goddesses are almost entirely absent. Typological similarities are otherwise pronounced, and there are additional ways in which the Devi Purana's 60 goddesses connect with yoginis. First is the Devi's inclusion of the Saptamatris, the seven mothers who feature in most pantheons of the 64 yoginis, or when absent, may nonetheless be matriarchs of eight yogini octads. There are grounds for seeing the Devi Purana's pantheon as an expansion of the seven mothers. First, the 60 goddesses are referred to once as a matri chakra, as I mentioned earlier, a group or circle of mothers. Second, the group of 60 goddesses is, like the seven mothers, joined by two very specific male gods, the elephant-headed Ganesha, or Vinayaka, and Vinadhara, the Vina bearer, the lute bearer, who can either be a Gana or a form of Shiva. Here he's designated as Tumbaru Bhareva. The seven mothers are typically flanked by these two figures, Ganesha and Vinadhara. This inclusion of the seven mothers and the, their associated male deities and the prominent roles given to Brahmi and Chamunda 
suggests that the Devi Puranas redactors viewed their pantheon of 60 as an expansive variation upon the, ma the Matris, much like the pantheons of 64 yoginis that would soon become popular. In fact, the Devi Puranas 60 goddesses did become the basis for a set of 64 yoginis, as described in Lakshmi Dhara's Kritya Kalpataru. This massive Brahmanical digest, Nibanda, was likely composed in the Gahardhavala court of Govinda Chandra in Banaras or possibly Kanauj in the early to mid 12th century. Its account of 64 yoginis simply expands upon the Devi Purana, reusing text while stripping away its ritual context. This brings me to a more tenuous but potentially important connection. The core pantheon of the late 9th to mid 10th century Hirapur Yogini temple of Odisha consists, like the Devi Purana, of a circle of 60 goddesses. These are headed by a comparatively large unidentified goddess who faces both the central shrine and the entry portal. So she's positioned here in niche 31, opposite the central shrine and the entry portal. The square central shrine contains four yoginis compared with four Bhairavas and presumably a central image of Shiva or Bhairava, which is now missing. In other words, the Hirapur Yogini temple does something similar to what Lakshmi Dhara does. It augments a circle of 60 goddesses to arrive at a pantheon of 64. The principal goddess also bears at least superficial similarity. Both the Hirapur deity and Sarva Mangala of the Devi Purana are 10 armed goddesses with a crown of matted locks. Unfortunately, on account of damage, none of the Ayudas or emblems of the Hirapur deity can be identified now. I would not suggest that the Hirapur temple was directly inspired by the Devi Purana. Uh, the pantheons of deities certainly do diverge. What I'm more comfortable suggesting is that this temple may preserve traces of the Devi Purana's pantheon and configuration thereof, directly or indirectly. More notably, they both share a concern with astrology and probably calendrical worship. For as Margaret Thompson first observed in the 1970s, the Hirapur Yogini temple contains at least eight goddesses whose mounts, whose vahanas, correspond to the emblems of 12 zodiac signs, which are common to both Hellenistic and Indic astrology. These are some of the um, zodiacal vahanas. In addition to the zodiac, several more yoginis seem to be planetary deities insofar as they incorporate emblems of the nine planets, the Navagrahas. The Hirapur statuary in this way reflects a vision of yoginis that departs from their representations in tantric literature and is much closer in spirit to the Devi Purana. Embodying the powers of the planets and the signs of the zodiac, its deities reveal a desire to influence the astral divinities regulating human experience. The presence of astrological goddesses may also point toward a cyclic calendrical liturgy of the kind found in the Devi Purana. In this way, Tantra goddesses who had earlier served as custodians of esoteric teachings, enforcers of initiatory secrecy, and even as invasive spirit beings are recast as ominous but potentially beneficent cosmic forces. Whether or not the Devi Purana cyclic worship of 60 goddesses of the years informs this transformation, in the Yogini temples we seem to encounter goddesses who, despite tantric roots, have been effectively integrated into the concerns of civic religion. In the concluding portion of this paper, I want to consider a development of the 11th century that seems highly pertinent to Yogini temples. It is well known that the Shaiva Siddhanta, mainly from the 12th century in Tamil Nadu, shifted its cultic fo focus decisively from the private rituals of initiates to the temple and public religion. There are indications of a similar development earlier in the 11th century in, in the Deccan and a goddess-centered cultic context. Alexis Sanderson has, has discovered two South Indian tantras of the cult of the seven mothers, headed by Bhadra Kali, centered on their worship in, in temples. These both bear the title Brahmiyamala 
and survive in unique South Indian manuscripts. These texts have genuine connections to the old Vidyapita Brahmiyamala, whose mantra deities they redeploy in the service of temple worship. Similar, similar literature of the Matri Tantra or Yamala genre survives from medieval Kerala. Remarkably, a lengthy Tamil inscription on the walls of the Chamundeshwari temple of Kolar district, Karnataka, corroborates the cultic prescriptions of the better preserved Sadra Yamala. This was first noticed by Sanderson and more recently elaborated upon by Whitney Cox in an excellent book on politics and poetry in medieval South India. Cox proposes that this text was in fact composed in conjunction with the inscription whose account of service personnel includes a teacher of grammar and of the Yamala Tantras. Those of you who have read the Yamala Tantras will find that a funny combination. Written in 1072 or 73 under Rajendra Chola's nascent reign, this lengthy inscription institutes a lavishly funded calendrical program of ritual presided over by a Shaiva abbot, probably a Kalamukha Shaiva, a Brahmin official, and a Tantric devotee of Pairava. In Sanderson's assessment, the cult de sources document, quote, is much more integrated into the civic dimension of religion than are the early North Indian Shakta traditions. The subject of these texts is not worship conducted by individual initiates for their own benefit or that of individual clients, but a calendrically fixed program of regular worship conducted by professional priests before permanent idols and temples. And the principal purpose of this worship is to foster the victory of the monarch over his enemies, and more generally, to protect the kingdom from danger. I would suggest that Yogini temples represent a comparable development, which began nearly a century earlier and probably not in South India. The adaptation of esoteric goddess pantheons and secret practice systems to a more col public calendrical liturgy suiting the aspirations of elite patrons and performed in permanent structures. Cox's comparison of the older Brahmiyamala and its southern namesake cogently captures this shift. While the former, quote, focused on the acquisition of magical powers and visionary encounters with wild female spirits, the Temple Tantra presents a detailed liturgy meant to secure royal victory and success. In harnessing the rites and mantras of the early Yamala cult in the service of political power, Rajendra Chola may have followed the well-established model of the Yogini temples, which with, with which he would doubtlessly have been familiar. Unique as it is, the Kolar temple inscription thus invites us to creatively imagine the kinds of innovation and patronage underpinning Yogini temples, whose individual stories seem to be irretrievably lost to us. Thank you. Thank you very much, Shaman. Well, I suppose the, yeah, the, perhaps the individual stories are completely lost, but you've done a wonderful job there of taking us further in our understanding of these uh, fascinating traditions. Um, so I'm going to use my use my. my uh, my chaired privilege to ask at least one question because um, early on, I think you were, I can't remember which, I think when you were, one of the earliest images you showed, you said that um, the central image is usually of Nateshwara. And that, I, that sort of, I pricked up my ears at that because Nateshwara figures sort of rather obscurely in some um, not, uh, not uh, yogi lineages, but I, you know, I don't know much about him at all. And you then didn't seem to mention Nateshwara again when you were sort of analysing the various different uh, textual yogini and matra traditions. I was wondering if you could just say a little bit more about what uh, what you meant there. And also, is Nateshwara is that as what is sort of more commonly called Nataraja, as in the dancing form of Shiva, or a different type of icon? So I think it's a um... Uh, Natasha is the kind of the prototypical form from the late Gupta era that is often found, uh, especially in, in the company of the Matris, the mother goddesses. So the dancing form of Shiva. This is the basis of the later image that becomes 
popularized under the name Nataraja. Uh, I, I suppose uh, Nateshwara and Nath lineages must refer to a guru though, right? Or it's not, not necessarily. It's a lineage called Nateshwari, which seems to have, you know, sort of Kaula associations, I'd have to. It's something I've, you know, that crops up occasionally, but I've never looked that deeply into it. But is, okay. do you find, you find him mentioned in the in the textual traditions as well? Actually, one of the one of the really interesting discrepancies between the temples and texts is that the iconic form of this image, and and uh, I don't know if I have a better one in my slide set, but I'm referring to the deity in the lower image here on this slide. I don't know if you can see my my yes. pointer. Uh, so that uh, really looks like Natasha, a form of Shiva. Most of the textual descriptions refer, though, to Bhairava or Chanda Bhairava. Uh, as being in the company of the yoginis or matris. So the, the textual sources tend to emphasize the presence of Bhairava, and what we actually find in temples is usually a slightly more um, serene form, uh, the dancing Shiva. But they are often, uh, what links the two forms of representation is dance, whether Bhairava or Shiva. Okay. So I don't think I have anything more intelligent to say about that, uh, something to look into more closely, I think. Intriguing. And I've got one one other sort of long shot question. I, I, I'd be amazed if you if you do know anything about this, but I'm going to try it anyway. I, I've been um, working with um, well Sandra Sattler, my PhD student, has been looking at Chamunda, and in a, in some of her iconography, you see a scorpion on her stomach, and we've long been wondering what on earth that means. And I, now I'm wondering if perhaps it's got something to do with sort of calendrical systems, and could there be an association with uh, the zodiac sign Scorpio? And have you, have you considered that or seen that or thought about it? I hadn't actually thought of that, but it's an interesting possibility. We do have the scorpion in the Hirapur temple, but sorry, I'm making a lot of noise here. The scorpion is one of the em zodiacal emblems in Hirapur. I don't know if I included it here. Yes, in the upper right. Uh, but that's not in association with Chamunda. So my inclination would be to say probably not. They're probably not related, but um, I think it's an open question uh, when, where and in what context the scorpion appears and what it signifies. Okay, we'll keep keep pondering that one then. All right, thank you. Um, I so do remember actually, I think many years ago, Sandra asked me that question and um, I'm not sure whether I found anything useful for her. I can't remember right now. Probably not if you're asking me again. <laughs> I know, I don't think you got, yeah, I, don't, I didn't hear it anyway. Um, okay, we've got a couple of questions. Questions have come in. The first one, is from Ruth Westerby. So hopefully someone, someone can take us there. Hi, uh, I'm sorry, I, I hope not to dominate the questions, but I know how the slider works. So perhaps, yeah. Thank you ever so much for the presentation, Sharman. That was really interesting and answered a lot of the questions that I've been mulling over. Um, I did have one about, um, well, I've got loads of questions, but one of them was about if on the one hand we have human women and if on the other hand we have uh, yoginis and goddesses, is there a kind of continuum between these two roles? Is there, what, what evidence is there for women um, uh, moving between these these positions. So yeah, a question more about the, the ritual and the practice. It seemed very much from your presentation that the purpose is uh, is like high ritual, public ritual. Um, okay, I'm asking two questions here now. There's the kind of human to goddess continuum and to what extent do women traverse that? And the other question is like the high to low ritual, um, like is it public, is it private? And who are the practitioners? Do we know anything about sort of women to male um, worshippers, that sort of thing. So, thank you. Okay. Thank you, Ruth. It's a lot there. Uh, please remind me to leave out if I forget one of your questions in the meantime. So what I, what I tend to see the yogini temples doing is moving away from the more esoteric aspects of earlier tantric yogini worship. And I think that the goddess woman continuum is uh, particularly underpinning and informing the logic of earlier tantric ritual. I feel that in the yogini temples, although folk beliefs about women and yoginis were no doubt quite prevalent, and we see that kind of, and we see story literature, for example, the Kathasarit Sagara, um, in which uh, stories of women and, uh, as yoginis, goddesses as, as women. Uh, so we see in story literature that popular beliefs probably continued with this, this um, continuum or conflation. I think in the temples, that's not necessarily operative to the same degree. I think 
the goddesses and temples are really being treated more like matris, the earlier mother goddesses, as um, as uh, not as tantric deities necessarily per se by most people ex encountering them there. So I'm not sure the extent to which the conflation or the continuum involving goddesses and women is important to the ritual logic of yogini temples. So that's part of your question, I think. Uh, and then you also asked about the, I think, the spectrum of practices and practitioners that might be present in the yogini temple. Um, there's a little bit of evidence for the presence or involvement of what we might expect, which is call a, a tantric practitioners and officiants. Um, the the um, uh, Varanasi Mahatmya studied by Peter Bishop has a really fascinating account of the yogini temple of Varanasi, in which we have the coming together of of um, uh, lay worship of the yoginis, um, jagaran, for example, night vigils, and other forms of uh, puja and homa, fire, fire worship, fire sacrifice are, are popular. But then there's also a reference to kula yogis, that is, uh, initiates who uh, seek visions of the goddesses in the sky. So I think that these places were no doubt um, inspired by tantric officiants or involved tantric officiants and probably involves some kind of um, initiatory practices. But that's not the vision that really obtains in most of the sources, which seem to treat them more as mother goddess temples, basically, to simplify things. And I'm sure I've left out a couple bits. So if you want to remind me, that would be, that would be great. Okay, thank you. That was perfect. That was really helpful. Cheers. OK. Thanks, Shaman. We've got a question from Amol Bunker, who I suspect is in Pune, if we can go to him late at night. All that we're very international this evening. You searching for him, Ruth. If you can't find him, I can read out the question. Um, I have asked, um, Amol is unmuted, uh, but uh, not, doesn't necessarily know it. <laughs> Sorry. <laughs> Uh, Mole, if you can hear, then I think you, if you just ask your question, you should come to the front. You should be able to see you. Okay, well, it's not working because it's, I think it's more of a comment, actually, a helpful comment about um, what I can read here. In, in Maharashtra, on Bhadra uh, Pada Am Amavasya, i.e., the, the dark of the moon in Bhadra, the Bhadra Pada month of Bhadra Pada, often known as Pikori Amavasya every year 64 yoginis are worshipped in the form of a pata drawn on paper so interesting yeah interesting. very interesting okay then we've got uh, a couple of anonymous questions so i will read the first one of those out which is and i i would like to know the answer to this because i often say it and i'm i'm worried that perhaps there isn't any basis for this but is there any specific reason to build the hypethral temples? Um, and because you know, I've often said, you know, you look, there's some rather nice aerial footed photos you can get of, of some of them as well. And the, the idea is that, you know, I thought that there's a, or well, the question is, is there any connection with the Kechari group of yoginis, i.e., the flying yoginis? Um, and are there any textual references explaining this? Yes, uh, the Varanasi Mahamya that Peter. Uh, edited actually has a interesting reference to um, having the darshan, the, the vision of the yoginis in the sky while conducting a night vigil in the yogini temple. So I think most scholars who have studied yoginis have tended to agree on the likelihood that their being open to the sky has something to do with the fact that yoginis fly. And I think now there's some good textual evidence for that too. I don't think we have, we can say too much more, unfortunately. But it certainly seems logical to me, and there is at least a little bit of evidence that um, their being open to the sky reflects uh, an engagement with goddesses who fly. Now, the earlier mother goddess temples, the temples of the Saptamatris and so forth, were not open to the sky in this manner, but they also have roots in uh, architecture that we probably have no inkling of because it doesn't survive. So uh, tantric literature and some other sources make reference to mantri temples as though they were uh, everywhere, uh, part of the religious landscape. And I presume that 
many of these were open air shrines. So there, it's speculative, but there, there could be continuity with earlier uh, kinds of uh, humble architectural contexts that we're not aware of. Okay, but the, so the the idea that I often repeat that the Yoganis, uh, I thought to land there is not attested in any form. That would, that's a sort of a jump too far, perhaps. Or a... oh, the launch pad idea. Uh, I think David White mentions that. I, I wouldn't think that there's any specific evidence for that, but um, I wouldn't rule it out either. Actually, sorry, the um, Yashas Tiluka seems to refer to the Yoganis um, alighting. It's kind of vague, it's, it's, it's poetry. It's not really uh, describing what happens in a ritual context, but it describes the flight of the yoginis. I, I believe it also refers to them alighting. It doesn't really talk about the temple context in, in much detail, but that I suppose we could interpret it as a reference to uh, descent from the sky. Okay, so some support there. All right, great, thank you. Um, now I can see that, uh, there's someone called uh, Vedika Subramaniam Ayer has put her hand up, but if she could go, well, we'll see, I'll give her a couple of minutes see if she can go to the Slido because that's how we normally do it. Meanwhile, there's another anonymous question is, what is the estimated time scale when the temples were built? And is there a consensus about this in the archeological literature? I think there's a good consensus about the dates of most of the sites being from the early 10th through the 12th century. There has been some speculation about 9th century datings, and I'm not an expert in this matter, but um, late 9th century seems reasonable for perhaps um, some of the rectangular uh, temples of, of central India, and uh, maybe for the, the um, Hirapur temple in Orissa. So late 9th or early 10th through the 12th century for the sites that we know of. And if there are any um, art historians or architectural historians who want to weigh in on that, I would certainly be interested. Is that I think, um, on stylistic grounds rather than inscriptions or anything? Mostly on stylistic grounds. There's, there are a few useful inscriptions. I think um, the, uh, the calligraphy used for the, for the, in, um, the labels of the Bhairagat Yoginis have been used by Deheji and others to suggest, a, I think a mid 10th century date. But we don't have many inscriptions. We don't have inscriptions associated with the founding of Yogini temples in most cases. Kimberly Masteller, I'll just mention, I don't know if she's here, has done some of the best work on the dating of the central Indian temples quite recently. Uh, now we have uh, Emma Stein has got a question, if we can reach her, please. Hi, Emma. You're muted. Unmute. Sorry, I just think I might have just muted her when she unmuted herself. I'm trying Oops. again. I won't do anything. Unmute herself. Uh, there we go. Okay, I got it. <laughs> Hi, Shaman. Thanks. Thanks for another great talk. Um, you mentioned the association of the matrikas with Vinadara and Ganesha, and I and that the matrikas appear sometimes in yogini temples. So I was wondering if there are, are any examples of Ganesha being included in a Yogini temple, since, as you know, the, there's a Vinadara that's been associated with the Tamil Yoginis slash Matrikas. All right, yes, I think in Bhairagat, of course, Bhairagat's a bit of a mess. The, the uh, images have been relocated. and But I think that there's a Vinayaka or Ganesha who's of the same stone and, and, and craftsmanship as the Yoginis. I'd have, have to double check, but I, I think so. I see Stella Dupuy nodding, and I'm sure she's right. <laughs> okay, great. Thanks so much. Okay, great. Uh, so we have a question from Bihani. We can go to Bihani, please. I wonder if this is Bihani Sarkar. I'm not sure. Now uh, I'm going to try to unmute her. Behani, you there? Hi, thank you, Shaman. That was a great talk. And um, hi. <laughs> uh, hi, Jim. Yeah, hello. <laughs> hi. So I have a question about which you've written previously. Uh, I know that there's an article uh, that, that you, you'd written some time ago. And uh, my question was, 
are there any differences between the yoginis and the matris um, in terms of their characteristics, in terms of their worship? Because in many of the Puranic texts, they're described in a way that, uh, that, that it seems that they're the same de de deities. I wonder if yoga, the mastery over yoga is one such uh, difference. But I, I think you might have written something about this. So if you could possibly summarize those previous arguments right now, that would be of huge help to me. <laughs> Thank you. Sure. So yoginis are, as a deity typology, certainly draw on the image of the mother goddesses, not only the seven mothers, but also the Kushana era mother goddesses who are more numerous and more diverse and a little more scary uh, in many cases. So the yogini as, as a typology draws very much upon earlier representations of matris. The, um, so what, I think by the time we have yogini temples and by the time yoginis become a significant part of Puranic discourse on yoginis, the uh, matri and yogini have been conflated to a very large degree. I see. So I think what we find is that both in tantric sources such as the Tantra Siddhava and in Puranic sources that, that um, yoginis and matris are um, often syn synonymous. Yes. Which is why we have, for one of the sources that I presented today, the Brihat Kalotra, doesn't ever use the word yogini, but the matris that it describes are yoginis in all but name. That mm. is, they're very, every bit yoginis, they, they have all the characteristics that, um, that I suggested in, in the piece that maybe you're referring to, uh, kind of polythetically, could be used to define what a yogini is. So I see the two terms as being becoming, at least in some contexts, synonymous. Um, you, sorry. Uh, the Devi Purana, they're not, though. Hmm. Uh, the Devi Purana refers to yoginis seldom and refers to them basically as tantric goddesses who are really, really powerful warriors in their sm small numbers, 24 usually. And I, for me, at least, that um, is one of a number of indications that the Devi is from a slightly earlier period than the yogini temples mm -hmm. and predates the emergence of yoginis into uh, popular religion to a large degree. So the matris of the Devi Purana are more or less the seven mothers or expanded versions of the seven mothers and yoginis are a little different. Mm. But there, there is one. There seems to, there seems to be one common, uh, important common ritual uh, um, uh, link, which is that both, at least in the Puranic literature that I'm more familiar with, both sets of divinities are uh, worshipped to protect civic spaces and community spaces. And uh, I wonder, do the yoginis get that from the matris? Because the matris have this very strong association with the protection of civic uh, or civic spaces or is it that the matris are getting that from the yoginis that's a great question i think probably the first way around uh, i think that when yoginis enter uh, civic religion they they carry forward that um that role of the matris as goddesses of war which i think we see already in the gupta era yes. cult of the seven mothers as imperial goddesses so i think that the yoginis enter uh, into that that image that space uh, but that's augmented also by all the power they draw on from tantric uh, associations yes okay thank you so now we also have something i didn't talk about but which i think is relevant here which is that the if we want to call them ritual technologies of the yamala tantras the the seventh uh, eighth century uh texts which are really oriented towards the private practices of of uh, ritualists for themselves, um, those te those mantric technologies, those ritual technologies, also get incorporated into a new genre of literature uh, for basically for uh, warfare and, and state protection and so forth. And the texts I have in mind here are the Yudha Jayarnava, the Ocean of Techniques for Victory in Battle, which survives in one fairly early Nepalese palm leaf manuscript. It, maybe it's a ninth century text. I, I don't know. Uh, no one's really worked on it. And then we have the Narapati Jayacharya um, of, I think, the 11th century, which actually names its sources, and these include the Yamala Tantras. So just as we have these earlier yogini tantric traditions being reimagined for or redeployed for uh, civic ritual uh, in temple worship, we also have 
um, kind of uh, battle magic and prognostication and other kinds of techniques from that earlier li ri uh, literature being repurposed as well. Right, thank you. Thank you. Thanks, John. So if uh, well, Vedika has still got her hand up, I'm not sure if that's deliberate. If um, she wants to ask a question, I can unmute. Might be like me and just clicks buttons, clicks things by mistake. Uh, otherwise, she's not. Well, I've got a very brief question. This you, you made the, about the Meltzer unpublished paper, which sounds great, but it sounds like it's been unpublished for a very long time. Is that do any that's any fine. when it might come out or? Is it circulating privately? If so, can we get copies? Um, what's the what's the status of that one? I, I, it's not circulating actually. And um, last time I asked her about it, it didn't seem like there was a imminent plan to publish. I, I'll pest her about that. Okay. Gudrun, are you here? I'm really, really looking forward to that, and I will encourage her again to publish soon. Okay. And great. it looks like Vedika Subramaniam Iyer is now uh, available. Okay, sir. <laughs> so is it, is it thank you uh, yeah thanks a lot for the talk it was very interesting um i my question is basically uh during the uh you know ancient um, times i mean like you know when i'm talking about like first second century bc uh we have seen a lot of uh images of yakshi or yakshinis i mean on uh you know on many of the uh, you know, temples and uh, many of the old ruins. Uh, so, I mean, I, I was I was uh, wondering if they are connected to yoginis. I mean, are yoginis a gradual transformation of these yakshi uh, yakshis? I mean, so um, that's. I mean, I was I was curious about that. I mean, yeah, that's a great question. So, I think that the the yoginis are drawing upon a number of deity typologies from earlier times, primarily matris. But the, I think maybe the line between Matri and Yogini is not, uh, sorry, between Matri and Yakshi, uh, there's probably a bit of overlap in, in some uh, of their associations. So the Yoginis are also drawing upon um, uh, the Ganas, they're drawing upon um, Apsara. But I think we see, we see, for example, some tales of dangerous Yakshinis from early Buddhist literature, being and and um, maybe probably from the Brihat Katha, the lost Brihat Katha, being turned into stories of yoginis later, and I think this reflects the fact that uh, both of these kinds of goddess uh, shared some features that made them am amenable to such a transformation. Thank you. <laughs> well, Shaman, Thank you. I, th I think you have to move on. Don't you? We've we've reached quarter past seven. Um, I have a few minutes. I have to be out of here by two, uh, two thirty, seven thirty. We've got a couple of questions. A rather difficult one, I'm afraid. I was hoping you would, you could, you know, you have the excuse of answering it in half, half a minute. Anonymous one. Why are the female goddesses associated with death and violence when this is usually associated with men? Uh, do you want to answer that one? Is it for us tricky? Association with death and violence. Well. So I think that um, yoginis emerge from a broader category, or at least in part from a broader category of deity referred to in the first millennium as graha. Now we think of graha mainly as the planets, the navagrahas, the nine planets. But in the earlier uh, tantric medical and non-tantric um, kind of spiritology tradition, graha refers to more or less any kind of dangerous spirit, uh, potentially a possessing spirit. Um, so yoginis, and those deities are not just female, they're male and female. Equal opportunity uh, um, affliction, I suppose. Uh, death, though, that's a tricky one. I mean, our deities of, of that, that incorporate images of death are both male and female. Mahakala and Chamunda, for example. So uh, Chamunda really represents our starkest vision of, of death as divine, but but we have Mahakala also. I'm not sure. I think I need to think about that a little bit more. Uh, obviously, goddesses are very frequently associated with, with um, fertility and life, and also 
uh, their opposites, the absence of life, the absence of fertility, and um, disease, though it's not specifically gendered, I think. So sorry, I don't think I have a good answer to that question. Okay. Lots to think about, though. Thank you. Um, okay, we've got one from Sandra. Uh, I'm getting that Sandra's. Oh, Sandra Sattler. I can unmute. I think you did the trick of muting her rather than unmuting her. Twice. I think I've done it twice. I'm just going to, yeah, there we go. I'm I know. That's perfect. Thank you. Hi, Shaman. Thank you so much for, for a brilliant talk. Uh, I was just wondering, you mentioned an emaciated goddess, Yogeshi, in the beginning. And, you know, obviously goddesses like Chamunda, there's this Chamunda type idea and that, you know, local names sometimes are used to express the same kind of idea of a goddess. But I'm just wondering whether we can use names really as a means to identify deities, yoginis in this case, or should we look at the function of the goddesses within the temple, like the location, even though I know it's difficult in the case of Bedagat, for instance, where the sculptures have been moved. But I'm just kind of finding it very difficult to pin down the goddesses based on the names when they seem to be, Yogeshi seems to be the same as Chamunda in some case. And it's, yeah, it's kind of, I guess, a methodolo methodological question in a way. I don't know what, what your take on it is. Right, so Yogeshi is usually the name used for the eighth mother in tantric texts and, and those that draw on them. And Yogeshi, her identity is definitely complicated. Sometimes she is uh, Bhairavi, Sometimes she is more like Chamunda. Um, sometimes I think she might be Siddhi Lakshmi or Mahalakshmi. So her identity is definitely uh, fairly complicated. I think basically it's complicated because she is added an add-on to the seven mothers to make them eight, um, to have to make them tantric deities. And so I think different tantric goddesses can be uh, plugged into that Yogeshi role. But I think fundamentally she's Pairavi. That, that's the most likely uh, use for the name. Now the Brihat Kalotra is a little unusual in having her be the emaciated one and Chamunda being corpulent. But that pantheon, the Brihat Kalotra, also has uh, a very large number of emaciated goddesses, I might mention, uh, four different Kalis and four different Revatis, and most of them are emaciated goddesses. So we ha have to be careful, of course, looking at an emaciated image and thinking this must be Chamunda. Thank you, Shami. We've got a little bit of time. A couple. Uh, we got one. We got from one. Sure. Why not? Okay, Stella, Stella Dupuy, please. I'll. I'm going to click unmute. Oh, maybe she can unmute herself. Okay, I'm clicking it. <laughs> yeah. Like that. No, I just wanted that we are talking of uh, Chamunda. I wanted to say that maybe this uh, Scorpio that you were asking in the beginning can be that is uh, normally is placed in the stomach in the area where normally uh, when you have flesh you are young is the prosperity is where children are there and then when she is emancipated she needs the help of a scorpio to protect that area the to have the venom to protect that area so i see the scorpio as a protector of uh, in chamunda's body and another thing is that in, uh, in um, Rani Pujarial, the one that um, Shiva is dancing, but she is uh, uh, Shiva Gayasura Samhara. She, he has the skin of, uh, of uh, the demon Gayasura, and he is dancing with the demon Gayasura. And very often when Shiva is dancing, he's dancing with this Gayasura and it's not the, the one that we know, the, the Nateshwara dancing normally. So. Well, that's a good point. Um, there are a number of earlier images of Natasha also in which she holds the elephant skin. So that, that's a good point. This is a, a point of distinction from the later South Indian Nataraja image that's so popular today. Thank you. And we also have uh, images of Chamunda and Bhairava with the elephant skin as well. Okay, well, we've got one more uh, anonymous question. Is there any connection between these yoginis as depicted 
in the texts and temples discussed and Hatha Yoga of the time. I don't like giving one word answers, but I think I will. Uh, no, <laughs> I, I don't think so. I really don't. Of the time. Well, I, uh, Jim, what do you think? I, well, I would say no, I mean, not, not of the time, but slightly later than that, the boy gate from 1230 CE. There are, there are eight martyr right. on there and there are Hatha Yoga postures at the, at the top of the gate. But no, I, they seem generally the yogini cult seems to predate Hatha Yoga. So what I will say, though, is that um, some of the earlier, sorry, some of the um, some of the early practitioners of Hatha Yoga may have come from Kaula lineages in which yoginis were important goddesses. And we see this al already with uh, Kaula sources that predate Hatha Yoga, sources like the Kaula Gyana Nirnaya and other uh, maybe 10th century or so Kaula sources where the legends of Matsyendra first emerge. There's no Hatha Yoga, but yoginis are important. And then, in, of course, we have texts like the Matsyendra Samhita from the 13th century, um, edited by Javakish, where we find these traditions coming together, Kala Yogini cults, with the emergent, I suppose Hatha Yoga is an okay term to use still. Okay, great. Well, look, th thank you very much, Shaman. We've kept you too long. And anyway. <laughs> You're in the middle of your we're, we're all sort of retiring you know we're, we're, well, and, and right, yeah. not done for the day, so i know you've got more on um this has been great i mean wonderful lecture wonderful q a and it's really nice to it feels like a sort of like an international conference because there's people all over the place and experts you've had a, a great crowd now what we do now is i'm actually not oh yeah i can see the. and i don't worry i can do it um, so yeah i'm gonna invite um so first of all um, if it's okay with those of you who ask the questions, we're going to keep the Q and A in for the YouTube video. If you have, if you do have an issue with that, do you know? Do let us know by any any channel possible. Um, it's going to take me, you know, a, a few days to get that video edited anyway, and then it will be up on YouTube for those of you that, that arrived late. Um, that'd be great. So I'm going to stop the recording in a moment, um, so that we can, uh, and then ask everyone to un unmute themselves, and then we can show our appreciation, say thank you to Shaman for an excellent talk and we'll see you soon a couple of weeks it's jamal jones in a fortnight i think it's our next event all right excellent Great. well thank all of you for for attending <laughs>